Amen. Well, good morning. Welcome to church. So glad that you're here. Can I share with you a quick testimony that I heard right before the service? You know, we try to create opportunities where, you know, the Holy Spirit can touch people like Vian did, praying for healing. And so a lady was, uh, one of our, our church members, Auntie Kat, was watching online because she had an injury, so she didn't come to church in person, and she couldn't walk. She was walking with a walker, but she decided, you know, I need to get to church. So she came to the 915 service. Pastor Kalai prayed for healing, and she walked out of here carrying her walker in her hand. God healed her walker. While she was in church, amen. So God can do anything. And that's for those of you watching online. If you're watching online, you need to get in person. Because, you know, when the anointing of the Holy Spirit shows up, it's, it's localized. It really is, you know. Think back to the upper room in the book of Acts. It fell in one place. And so sometimes if you're watching online, sure, God can touch you. But, man, when you're in person and the Holy Spirit wants to move, you want to be where the Holy Spirit is. Amen. So I just thought I'd throw that in for bonus. So amen. Thank you, Auntie Cat, for coming and getting healed. Praise God for that. Amen. Well, as was mentioned, we're beginning a brand new series this morning entitled Ohana Matters. Uh, and the subtitle is Because Family Matters Most. And when our preaching team got together and we were deciding, you know, uh, where do we feel like the Holy Spirit's leading us this fall? We felt like this was an important series because we want to see what the Bible teaches about how to build families that experience the blessing of God and that walk in the grace of God. The Bible's very clear about different ways that we can build our lives and how he designed marriage to be and family to be. And as we walk in alignment with his word, we bring his blessing into our families. And we thought this would be a very important series, and so we're excited to do it. And then on top of that, you add the recent crisis that's gone on in Maui, and you realize in the midst of crisis, what matters most really is family, isn't it? When we face crisis in our lives, challenge in our lives, we're thinking about the people in our lives. Where are they? How are they? Are they doing okay? That's what matters most to us. But sadly, as we get busy in life and distracted with the cares of this world, we can put other things as a higher priority. Isn't that true? And the things that really matter most often get pushed to the side. And so we wanted to focus on family in this series and help us to develop families that honor God and bring his blessing into our lives. And so the title of my message this morning is this, Blood is thicker than water. Blood is thicker than water. I got to admit, I stole that from Pastor Kalai George. He comes up with cool titles. Uh, my title for this message would have been The Biblical Purpose of Marriage, you know, and Family. So super boring, I know. I, you know, I'm not creative like that, but he's like, what about this? I was like, oh, that's cool. I'm going to steal that. Um, so, you know, what do you think about when you hear the phrase, blood is thicker than water? Typically, when somebody says that, they're, they're trying to remind you of what's really important, right? Come on, man, blood is thicker than water. You better show up to grandma's birthday party. Blood is thicker than water. I don't care if you're dying. Blood is thicker than water. You better be there, right? I mean, it's to remind us of our loyalties to our family and that family is more important than anything else, right? Sometimes that phrase can be used kind of manipulatively, right? Like, oh, you want to do something else? Hey, bro, blood is thicker than water. You better do what we want you to do because family matters more than anything else. Now, while I do agree that family matters very much in, in culture and in the Bible, I want to say that family isn't the most important thing. Now, I know some of you are like, oh, how dare he say that, you know? Don't hear what I'm not saying. Family is very important, but what's most important is God at the center of our families, because in, 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 in the West, in Hawaii, we can easily elevate family to almost a God status. That family is more important than anything else, including God. Where Jesus said, you have to forsake your mother and father to follow me. Now, he didn't literally mean that, but what he meant was you got to put me above even those things which you think are most important. God has to be first. And God at the center of our families is what leads us to the blessed life that God has created for us to live. And that's what I want to start us off with in this series. We're going to talk about, you know, how, how does the Bible, what does the Bible teach about family? How can we build our families in a way that honors God and build, brings his blessing? And we're going to start off with realizing that at the center of our families, it has to be God. It has to be God. Turn to your neighbor and tell them God has to be at the center. We're going to begin today by looking at the book of Genesis. Genesis is the first book in the Bible. It's also the first book in what's called the Pentateuch, or the five books penned by, by, by Moses, the prophet Moses. It is commonly known that Moses went up onto the mountain and spent 40 days with God, and there he received the revelation from God about everything from the very beginning to the purpose and the destiny of Israel and all of mankind. And so we're going to pick it up here in Genesis chapter 1, the book of beginnings that helps us to understand how God created humanity, how God created the world, and, and how we are to live in relationship with him. Genesis 1, starting in verse 27, says this, So God created mankind in his own image. In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. God blessed them and said to them, Be fruitful 
and increase in number. Fill the earth and subdue it. Rule over the fish in the sea and the birds in the sky and over every living creature that moves on the ground. Verse 31. God saw all that he had made and it was very good. And there was evening and there was morning the sixth day. Can we pray this morning as we begin? Father, we thank you for your word that reveals your heart to us and your heart for us as your sons and daughters. I pray, Holy Spirit, that you would come into this moment, lead and guide us, speak to us what you want to speak to us, and how we can build our lives and orient our lives around you so that we can bring forth your blessing, not just into our own families, but to our communities and beyond. Like concentric circles, God, as we receive your word as individuals, may it spread out into our families, our neighborhoods, our communities, and the world. We thank you for this in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. Right off the bat, when we look at this text, I want to highlight something. <clears throat> first of all, the very first thing that God did after he created mankind, verse 28, it says, God blessed them and said to them, be fruitful and increase in number. The very first thing God did was he blessed mankind. He blessed humanity. Now, I think this is very important because there are a lot of theological traditions that really just emphasize the rules, right? And the punishments if you break the rules. Like you better go to church, you better follow God, or else lightning's gonna come from the sky because he's actually really mad at you. And so you gotta make him happy with you. So you better do all these things, you know, to absolve yourself so that you receive God's blessing. The, ver the very first thing God did was not throw down a rule book from heaven. I made you. Now, here's 10,000 things you better do or else. A lot of people think of God like that. But the very first thing God did is he blessed his sons and daughters that he created. And he said, I want you to be fruitful. In other words, have lots of babies, build large families, and fill the earth with the goodness in the garden. I want you to take it out to the entire world. He blessed them. The very first thing God did was he blessed humanity. And I think that's so important. That his intention, his original heart, his original intention from the very beginning was to bless us. Now, yes, ever since that moment, as we'll see, we strayed from God and started to live in this thing called sin and brought all kinds of consequences that we do need to repent of and get right. But from the very beginning, God is not a God that looks to punish people. He's a God that loves to bless people. Can I hear an amen to that? From the very beginning, he wanted to bless our families with his goodness and his grace. And when we walk with him and when we walk in alignment with God's word, we experience more of his blessing. But the opposite is also true. The further we drift from God and the more we disobey his word, the less blessing we receive and the more of the curse enters into our lives. But God's heart from the very beginning was to bless us. And this is so, so important because many of you may have grown up in a tradition that made you more afraid of God than anything else. Or you've heard, heard things that made you more kind of skeptical or want to keep God at a distance. But God is a God that loves to bless. Like any good parent loves to bless their kids, God is a God that loves to bless his kids. But just as any good parent wouldn't bless their kids if they're in disobe disobedience or rebellion or beaten up on their brother or sister, neither does our, our Father in heaven. And so we need to align ourselves with his word. But it's so important we understand God loves to bless his kids. Turn to your neighbor and tell him, God loves to bless his kids. All the introverts cringe whenever you say, turn to your neighbor. I know, I know, I get it. I don't like that either, but <laughs> help you make friends, you know, in church. All right, anyway, the first point here in your notes is this. We were made to thrive in relationships when God is at the center. When God is at the center, he made us to thrive in relationships. He made us for relationships. He made us because of relationship. And we thrive when God is at the center of our lives. When you just look back at the text that we just read, Four times the name God is mentioned. And whenever you see a word or a phrase repeated, especially in a short se uh, section of scripture, that's the author trying to bring an emphasis. It's like bold, underline, italic, highlighting, right? They didn't have those tools when they're writing on parchment, and so they would just repeat stuff. You repeat it over and over, it means there's a bold, there's an emphasis. What's the bold here? God. Four times the name of God is mentioned. So God created mankind. In the image of God, he created them. God blessed them and God saw all that he had made and it was very good. What's the whole point here? What is the emphasis? We're made for God. And God is meant to be at the center of mankind, of humanity, of your life, mine, your marriage, my marriage, our families. God has to be at the very center. And when God is at the center, we can experience his blessing. But when God is not at the center... When we treat God like an accessory or an appendage or something that we just, you know, pull out when we need help or when we're going through crisis or we need a blessing, that's not the way God's intended for us to live. He's created for us to live with him at the very dead center of our lives. And so we need to make him the center of our marriages. We need to make him the center of our families. We need to make him the center of our parenting and how we raise our children. 
For those of you that are single, you got to make God the center of your life now. Because don't think that if, if God's not at the center, you'll just flip a switch one day and then all of a sudden he'll be at the center when you get married. I was the college pastor here at Pearlside for about 10 years and I can't tell you how many times a young person said, I'll get serious with God when I get older. When I'm done with college, when I'm done having my fun, then I'm going to get serious with God. And I can't tell you how many young people shipwreck their faith with that type of thinking. Because you don't just flip a switch, number one. We live based off of habits. Isn't that true? So if you've built a habit of yourself at the center of being selfish and living for pleasure and feeding your flesh for 30 years, don't think just because you said, I do, you're now going to be not selfish magically. Right? All the people that got married, you know that, right? You're the same person the day after your wedding as the day before your wedding. You just have more jewelry on. You know, it's the only difference, really. And somebody's sleeping in your bed, taking up 60% of the bed, even though she's half my size. Anyway, that's a whole other story. It's amazing how much space my wife takes up. I'm like, crowned in the corner, I'm like, oh my God. Anyway, right? This, that's really the only difference. You're still the exact same person because of the habits that we built up as single people, we bring into our marriage and we bring into our parenting. If we were selfish, living for our flesh, living for ourselves, don't think you're just going to flip a switch and now all of a sudden be the man or the woman that you're supposed to be that God's created. We have to start now. So what we tell all the young people is you got to begin your faith now. you got to start investing in that now if you want to have the blessing of God in your life later on. Wherever you're at, whatever stage in life, it starts today. Amen? If you hear the voice of the Lord and the Holy Spirit is calling you, it starts today to take God seriously and to take your faith seriously and to invest in it because that's the person you're going to be and that's the legacy that you're going to leave behind to other people. It starts today, putting God at the center. So if you're married, we got to bring God to the center of our marriage. If you're single, you got to bring him into your life now if we want the blessing of God because that's how he made us. You can say, well, I don't think that's fair. I want to live however I want to live. Okay. Yeah, you can deny gravity all you want. You jump off that building, you're going to fall. You can deny the reality that God made you to be at the center of your life all you want, but there's going to be consequences to that. Or we can surrender to the word of God and say, you made me for a relationship with you first. I'm going to bring you into the center and watch as God begins to bless your relationships. doesn't matter how broken, doesn't matter how messed up, God can heal and restore. I've seen so many marriages healed, so many relationships between parents and kids healed. I've seen so many people restored in their lives. In the life of this church, many of you have that testimony. But that only happens when we bring God into the center. No one can make you do that. God won't even make you do that. It's a choice that you have to make yourself. Can I hear an amen to that? And you're here this morning because you want to do that. Praise God. I know I'm preaching to the choir. It's all the people that are at home right now that need to hear this. I know. But just a friendly reminder to all of us. Because we don't mean to, but every now and then we drift. Isn't that true? Maybe we won't drift super far, but in one area of our life, it becomes about me. It becomes about sin. It becomes about flesh. In that area, we need to make God the center again. If God is at the center, we can experience our relationships the way that God designed. Number two, with God at the center, we can live as God designed us to. We can live as God designed for us to live. Continuing with the Genesis narrative in, in chapter 2, verse 16, then the Lord God commanded the man... You are free to eat from any tree in the garden, but you must not eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, for when you eat from it, you will certainly die. Now notice this. God gave one command. But notice it starts with you're free to do anything you want in this garden. You're free to eat from anything. You're free to live. Again, not a book of rules, really just one. Just don't eat from that one tree. And many have speculated, you know, was there some, some, something significant about the tree? Probably not. It was just God said not to do it. There was one thing he said not to do. Just don't eat from that tree. Isn't it funny that the one thing that we're told not to do, that's the thing that we want to do, right? Don't touch that. Why does a child want to touch it so bad? It's just because you said not to do it. There's this rebellious thing inside of every single one of us that if we don't squash, can lead to death and destruction. And so we see here, God gave us, again, a blessing and freedom. But one thing, don't do that one thing because death will enter into your existence. God is at the center. We can thrive, but... We have to keep him at the center. But I want you to see this, Genesis 2.25. This is, many theologians agreed, Abe, Moses' statement that is kind of like, this, this is the pinnacle of humanity. This is the, 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 this is the description of creation in its fullness. You ready? Adam and his wife were both naked and they felt no shame. He could have said anything at the end of Genesis chapter 2. He could have said Adam and his wife were super, super happy. They were really, really blessed. Everything was really, really awesome. I know the Bible doesn't ever say those words, but you know what I'm saying? Like, 
It, it could have been super, he could have used anything to describe the pinnacle of mankind in creation. Instead, he chose these words, naked and unashamed. Now all the, all the teenagers are like, <laughs> he said naked, yeah. Were they physically naked? Yes. But the point here, far more than physical, was there was an emotional transparency. They were fully vulnerable with one another and were experiencing no shame. They were naked and unashamed. They were known and fully loved. And isn't that what every single one of us want in our relationships? This freedom to be completely transparent and still be loved. To be vulnerable and to still be loved in our flaws, in our weaknesses, in our shortcomings, fully known and fully loved. And this is the way that mankind is described. When we're walking with God and God at the center, we can have these relationships where we can be fully known and fully loved, not afraid of being rejected, not afraid of being bullied, not afraid of being canceled, not afraid of, I have to walk on eggshells because I don't want to offend and I don't want to be you know, attacked, I don't want to be, you know, this. We want to have relationships like that. But sadly, most of us grew up in situations where it wasn't like that. If you showed any weakness, it was jumped on, right? If you, if you got out of a line, you, you, you were slapped down. You know what I mean? It was just, it, our relationships were more hostile than anything else, even in our own homes. That's not the way that God intended it to be. And when we bring him into the center, we can have families where we can experience this being fully known and fully loved, naked and unashamed, fully accepted, even in our weaknesses. That's what we all desire. And that can only happen when God is at the center. Because as we'll see, once we push God out from the center, Shame enters in and begins to destroy our relationship. So when God is at the center, we can experience this being known and fully loved. When God is fully at the center of our lives. The second thing we see is that when God is at the center, we can overcome any challenge in life. Any obstacle that would come our way. When God's at the center, we can overcome because we're made to keep God at the center. I had the opportunity yesterday of uh, officiating a celebration of life service for a uh, person who attended our church, uh, family is, is in our church, so they asked me to do the celebration of life service. And when I was younger, I used to really not enjoy these moments because, you know, funerals are tough to do, right? It's very emotional, very painful, it's a hard, hard thing. And, but what I've come to realize over the years is people are very open at funerals because when you're sitting there contemplating what's on the other side of this life, right, you're wide open. <laughs> in fact, those are, that's sometimes the only time people really think about what happens after death is when you're sitting in that chapel staring at whether it's a coffin or an urn and you realize, man, what's going to happen to me when I die? And I realize, man, people are open. It's a great opportunity to preach the gospel. Well, anyway, about a week ago, I sat with a family and they you know, were talking through what we're going to do with, with this, this celebration of life service. And the husband of the, of, of the woman who had passed on said, I really want to make sure that we preach the gospel. She would really want the gospel to be preached. I said, amen, brother, let's do it. And he said, so pastor, can you do a, an altar call at the end and ask people to receive Jesus? I said, sure, I can do that. If you want me to do that, I'll do that. And, I said, and, and by the way, most people don't ask for that at funerals. They're like, don't offend my family, you know. But he was like, no, we got to lead people to Jesus, what she would have wanted. And then the, the dad said, to, then, then, then I said to him, I said, you know what's even better than me doing it is if you would ask them to receive Jesus. And I kind of thought he'd say, nah, 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 you do it, Pastor. You know, you better than me, whatever. He was like, okay. I was like, let's go. Let's go, uncle. Come on, right? So we talked it through. We came up with a plan and all that. We got to the service yesterday, and it was beautiful because the, the daughter, uh, the lady who'd passed away, comes to our church. She's in one of our small groups, shared a beautiful eulogy, probably one of the best eulogies I ever heard, and shared her te the testimony of her mom. My mom was always praying, all this kind of stuff, and prayed for us, and, and then she shared about how we know where she is. She's in heaven, and we get to see her again one day, and I was just going, man, this is powerful, and then the husband gets up, reads a bunch of scripture, starts preaching. I'm like, man, what, what am I going to do? <laughs> you know, you're doing everything. Like, I, I literally was sitting there going, like, I, like, you don't need me. So much so when I finally got up there, I was like, you know, typically they invite the minister in to give perspective, you know, to bring comfort and to share a biblical perspective. You guys did such a good job. I feel like I'm not needed. You know, everybody laughed, you know. But really, I was like, wow, you guys did such an amazing job. I don't need to be here. But I shared a short message anyway, and then I called the husband back up to do the response part. And he led everyone in a prayer. The whole chapel, a little over 200 or so people repeated after him, prayed, this, prayed a sinner's type of prayer. And that man, I got goosebumps sitting there. It was so powerful. But what was even better, he said, it's not just praying a prayer. You got to believe in those words. And you got to go to church. You got to find yourself. I mean, he was going off. I was sitting there. I was like, hallelujah, brother. Come on. <laughs> I wanted to jump on my chair, like get all Pentecostal up in this place. I was like, well, where am I? You know, I was like, I was like praise God. It was so powerful. And I was just like, man, that's the power when God is at the center of your family. 
When God is at the center of your family, even death, what is the greatest crisis in most people's lives is a celebration. Even the eight-year-old granddaughter was saying, I know where my grandma is. She's in heaven and we get to see her again. I was just like, that's the power when we have Jesus at the center of our lives. Even death, the thing that should crush us, is a source of hope and is a source of joy. And I, and I just talked to the, the, the family this, this morning. She said, man, they got so many comments from friends and family just thanking them. And they were so inspired by that. And now they're trying to connect and get people plugged in. And maybe some of you are here because of that, whatever. But that's what happens when we have Jesus at the center. Listen, I've been at a lot of other funerals where Jesus clearly was not at the center of that person's life. And you can't celebrate. I've had family members come up to me in those moments and say, do you think my loved one went to heaven? I don't know what to say sometimes. Because I don't know. Only God knows that. And if the person didn't follow Jesus in their life and, you know, and all that, I can't, I'm not going to guarantee that. I can't, I don't even know what to say in those moments. Sometimes I say, I don't know. I don't like doing that. I love going to these celebrations of life where I can say, I, oh yeah, we all know where she is. She's with the Lord. And, and if you receive Jesus, you can see her again. You will. It's a very different experience. Very, very different. I've even been at the bedside of people who've passed away who know Jesus. Man, there's joy in that room, as painful and as hard as that moment is, because they know in a, in a few moments, my loved one is going to be with Jesus and rejoice. They're not going to be sick anymore, and we'll see him again. I've also been at the bedside of people that definitely didn't know Jesus and rejected him. And there's a lot of fear and a lot of pain and a lot of anxiety. We have to put Jesus at the center of our lives, amen? God needs to be at the center. And when he is at the center, no matter what challenge, no matter what obstacle, you and I will overcome because we are made to live with God at the center. And whenever we try to put anything else in the center, it may satisfy for a little while. But then crisis comes. Obstacles come and we realize it's not enough. It's not enough. We can live for success. And while you're succeeding, man, it's amazing, right? You're riding the ride of, of income and money and fame and all this kind of stuff. But then what happens when you hit a wall? got to turn to drugs and alcohol and substances to cope. we got to medicate with sex and all these other things. And then you realize at the end of your life, that's not going to save you. Or we can choose today to put God at the center and live with him at the center and experience his blessing in our families, in our marriages, in our relationships. And most importantly, when we face the ultimate crisis of death, Jesus must be at the center. It's how God made us and it's how he calls us to live this life. The third thing we see in, in scripture because it didn't stay that way. God created us to be naked and unashamed, but all of us have grown up and have lived in situations where we're not experiencing the blessing of God, right? I remember I used to say, man, if God loves us, right, then why are we experiencing so much pain and suffering in this life? Because we as, as a people have rejected him. We as individuals have pushed him to the side, and we've put other things at the center rather than God. And when we do that, when we invite sin into our lives, we invite the curse of sin and death that comes along with it. And that's what happened. Genesis chapter 3 tells us the very next thing happened. Right after God declares they were naked and unashamed, this beautiful picture of humanity called to be blessed and called to thrive. The very next verse, Genesis 3 chapter 1, now the serpent was more crafty than any of the wild animals the Lord God had made. He said to the woman, did God really say you must not eat from any tree in the garden? I want to note there, the enemy's attack is always to get us to doubt the word of God. He always comes to challenge and put so seeds of doubt and discord between us and the word of God. We'll come back to this more next week, but I want to point that out. He's always going to challenge the word of God. Did God really say? Nah, he didn't really say that. Does the Bible really say that? Nah, it doesn't really mean that. Always trying to drive a wedge between us and the word of God. Verse 2. The woman said to the serpent, we may eat fruit from the trees in the garden, but God did say you must not eat fruit from the tree that is in the middle of the garden, and you must not touch it or you will die. Quick question, did, did God ever say not to touch the fruit? He did not say that. He said, do not eat from the fruit. See, something happens when we add to the word of God, put in stuff that's not really there, it causes discord and dissonance, and, and, and we, we can miss the whole point altogether. See, because what might have happened, if, if let's say Adam told Eve, hey, don't even touch it, okay? Like, stay far away from the truth, because God said, don't even touch it, even though he didn't. You know, it's, just, it's, it's like, you know, like when you tell your kids, like, you know, don't, don't eat ice cream ever, or you'll die. I, I've never said that, but maybe some of you have. You know what I mean? Then they're going to go, oh, really? Oh, then I'm going to do it just to find out, right? It causes this, I want to, like, test it out now. And so if Adam told Eve, don't even touch it, she might have gone, well, I didn't die. 
You know what I mean? Oh, so maybe the word's not true. Maybe everything that, that I was taught and everything that God said isn't really true because I touched it and nothing happened because God never said not to touch it. Sometimes we can add stuff to the word of God when it's not really in there. Anyway, I'm getting ahead of myself. That's more next week, but anyway. God didn't say that. Verse four, you will not certainly die, the serpent said to the woman, for God knows when you eat of it, your eyes will be opened and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. God's holding out on you. There's no real consequences here. He just doesn't want you to experience life. He just doesn't want you to have fun. He just doesn't want you to experience blessing in this life. He's holding out on you. Verse six, when the woman saw that the fruit of the tree was good for food and pleasing to the eye and also desirable for gaining wisdom, she took some and ate it and she also gave some to her husband who was with her. Note that he was with her and he ate it. Then the eyes of both of them were opened and they realized they were naked so they sewed fig leaves together and made coverings for themselves. Theologians have been asking this question for thousands of years. Why didn't Adam stop his wife from eating the fruit? He was clearly with her. Now, there's lots of different possibilities. We don't really know. Maybe he was too busy because, you know, NFL season was on and his, you know, the Niners were playing. And he's like, oh, I'm talking to a snake, honey. Okay, cool, whatever, you know. Shh, you know, I'm busy, you know. Whatever, he, he, was, he was too distracted. He was too busy. Maybe he secretly wanted to eat the fruit, but he wanted her to go first. Let's see what happens. You know what I'm saying? Like, whatever the reason, we don't know. Either way, he didn't do his job because the word came to Adam and he didn't do his job and sin entered as a result. Whatever his excuse is, whatever his reasons are, he didn't lead and he didn't do his job. You know, I think it's interesting that there are a lot of, there's a lot of studies done now on the, on the, the relationship or the, the influence that dads have on the faith of their families. Can I share with you just a few couple of things right here? One study found that if the mother goes to church, but the father doesn't, right? Mom's going to church, dad's staying at home or going golfing. Less than 2% of kids will grow up to be worshipers later on in life. Less than 2%. If the mom's going to church, but dad's doing something else. But watch this. If the dad or the father is going to church and not the mother, somewhere between 66 and 75% of kids will grow up to have faith as adults. That's a pretty big disparity, don't you think? If the dad is the one with faith and the mom isn't, 65 to 66 to 67 to 75% of kids grow up having faith later on as adults. When the father is the first in the family to get saved, there's a 93% probability everyone else in the household will follow. There's power there. If Adam had done his job, things might have been different. Anyway, but but as fathers, as husbands, as grandfathers, as uncles, we have a lot of power in influencing the faith of our families. Another study focused on the attendance of Sunday school or what we would probably call our small groups, right? What we do during the week in smaller groups and found similar results on the impact of fathers. When both parents attend the Bible study in addition to a Sunday service, 72% of their children attend, right? Obviously when both parents are doing it, uh, that's a good example. When only the father attends, 55% of the children will when they're grown adults. When only the mother attends, only 15% of children will when they're grown adults. There's significantly greater impact when it comes to the relationship of fathers in the faith of their kids. Now this shouldn't discourage single mothers. You know, studies show that about 40% of young people now grow up in single mother households. That doesn't diminish you. Actually, the studies also show that single, single mothers have a profound impact on the faith of their kids, irrespective of what the father is doing. You know, some people have, you know, I, I read a couple of studies as to why, you know, why, you know, when the dad's not around, it doesn't really matter. I think it's partly because the kids don't see the bad example of the father, right? Dad's not around for better or for worse, so we're going to follow the faith of the mother, right? Because imagine that. Mom's trying to drag the kids to church on Sunday morning and dad's sitting on the couch watching TV. What message does that send to the child? Ah, this isn't really that important then. It's not that important. Ah, mom's just being crazy, you know, you know, mom, you know. Dad just, if dad's going to stay home, this isn't a big deal. Oh, dad's going golfing. Oh, it must not be that big of a deal. And when I'm older, I'm going to decide for myself and I'm going to be like that. There's a profound relationship that fathers have. And so this is to encourage all the dads. Look, if you're the first in your family, I was talking to a dad earlier who's really believing for his family to get saved. I said, just stay consistent. Stay consistent because the, the, the studies show you're making an impact whether you realize it or not. But we have to be consistent. We have to lead and we have to lean in. We got to go first and to lead in our families and to make an influence in, our, in the lives of our kids. We've seen it, you know, whenever football season comes around, football season starting this week, whenever the Seahawks and the Niners are playing, church attendance goes way down. Not so much when the Cowboys are playing. I don't, I don't know. 
I don't know what that says, but <laughs> we have to lead. Amen. If we want the blessing of God in our families and we want the blessing, it's, and it doesn't come just because well, I provide and I, and I work really hard so that my kids can have a good education. No, we got to lead them in faith. Listen, I don't care if my kids don't ever get on the honor roll and get scholarships. I hope they do, by the way. Wink, wink. One of my kids is here. I hope they get scholarships because college is expensive. But listen, what I want more than anything else is that they have faith in God. So that when they're at my funeral one day, they will say, I know exactly where my dad is. He's in heaven, and I'm going to see him again. I want them to be able to stand up in the face of whatever obstacle comes in their lives and know for sure that God is at the center of my life, God is at the center of our family, and I know exactly what God is calling us to do and where he's calling us to be. That's far more important. But I see so many families put so much in all the other stuff, sports and all this stuff. And listen, I'm a sports dad. I get it. But I'm not going to sacrifice what's most important for that. Because who cares if they, if they make a ton of money in life but lose their faith? What good is it, Scripture says, to gain the whole world and forfeit your soul? In other words, you can get it all in this life and lose everything in the next. What good is that? As a dad, I don't want that for my kids. I don't want that for my future grandkids, so it starts with me. I got to be a good example. It starts with you. You got to be a good example. And then we lead our families to putting God at the center. And throughout this series, we're going to unpack different aspects of how we can do that. But it starts with us. Can I hear an amen? Everybody say, it starts with me. It starts with me. I didn't grow up in a Christian family. I didn't grow up with my parents going to church. Most of you know my story. I grew up in a broken home. My dad was in jail for much of the time of my life. And when I got saved, I determined I'm going to give to my kids what I never had. And I'm not just talking about material things. Most importantly is faith in Jesus Christ. Because I know that's what's going to lead them to the greatest success in life. Because again, I don't care how rich they are if their marriage falls apart. I don't care how much money and how successful they are if, if their kids, you know, go wayward on them. No, no, no. What's more important than any material success is faith and putting God at the center. Is that your priority this morning? Because the world tells you they got to be, you know, on all the dance teams and all the sports teams and all of this and all of that and all the honor rolls. And so they're at trainings and practices and, oh, church, yeah, that comes later. Oh, church, yeah, we don't have time for that. A uh, small group, that's not that important because we got to do all these other things. I got to tell you. That's a recipe for disaster. It is. Because what we're teaching them is God is not that important. Mom said violin's more important. Piano's more important. Training's more important. Those things are important, but not more important than God. Amen? We got to make sure our priorities are in the right place. And I know I'm preaching to the choir because you're here. Sorry. I just got to say it. For those that are watching online are going to watch it later who aren't here. Amen. Now, we need to all be reminded because we tend to drift. Isn't that true? I know I do, so I'm reminding myself I'm right there with you guys. Amen. All right. The good news is this. When we repent, no matter how far we've drifted, no matter how far off course we've gotten, Jesus' blood cleanses us of our sins and restores our relationship with God. No matter how far we've been off, no matter what we've placed in the center, when we repent and turn back to God, he cleanses us of our sins and restores our relationships. Romans 6.23 says, For the wages of sin is death. But the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. In Acts 3.19, repent then and turn to God so that your sins may be wiped out. That times of refreshing may come from the Lord. Repent and turn back to God so that your sins may be wiped out. And times of refreshing may come from the Lord. You know what repentance is? Repentance is you're heading in one direction and you turn around. A lot of people think repentance is just saying you're sorry, Right? So like, I'm walking away from God. Hey, sorry, God, but you know, I'm still kind of doing this. Sorry, God, can you forgive me? Can you bless me? But you're still heading in the same direction. That's not repentance. Repentance is you realize you're going in the wrong direction and you stop and you make a 180 degree turn in the other direction and you turn back to God. That's what this verse says. That's what repentance is, turning. It's the Greek word metanoia, which literally means to have a change of mind. I'm not going to head in the same direction. I'm changing my mind and I'm going to head back to God now. Here's what I love. No matter how far you've drifted, no matter how rebellious we've been, we can turn back to God. You're saying, Pastor, you know, I'm not that bad. I do get distracted every now and then. Well, you need to repent in that area. Pastor, I'm here in church. Obviously, I want to follow God. Yeah, but in that area of sin that you kind of hold on to, chasing after pleasure, chasing after money, chasing after this, chasing after that, you need to repent. Whatever that area is that we tend to drift, we need to turn around and turn back to God. And here's what I love. When we do we don't find an angry God going, oh, bro, where you been? We don't find an angry God with his arms folded, just going, disappointment. 
Oh, you again. Huh. Oh, now you let come back. Huh? No, we don't find that. We don't find an angry God wagging his finger at us. We find his arms wide open saying, welcome home. His nail-scarred hands, his bloodied brow, welcoming us back into relationship with himself. That's the God that we find. And maybe some of you have been afraid to repent because you were afraid about how's God going to receive you. Let me tell you exactly how he's going to receive you with open arms, like a loving father ready to welcome his kids back home. However you've drifted, however you're prone to drift, turn back. Turn back to God. And we're going to partake of communion in just a moment. I want to give us an opportunity to do that. No matter how broken, no matter how lost, no matter how messed up, it's never too late to come back to God and to get a second chance, a third chance, a fourth chance. Turn around and come back. I was talking to a guy in my small group the last couple of weeks, and a couple of years ago, he was in a coma for about six months, went through some health challenges and complications, was in a coma. And so he was sharing with us in the group, and I, I just asked him, man, what was it like to be in a coma? You know, like, I mean, what was going on in your mind during that time? He said, he said, during that time, I had some very vivid dreams. I said, well, what were those dreams like? And he began to tell us that the most common dream that he had was he would hear the voice of his children in his dream, and he'd be searching, trying to find them to get back to them, and he could never get back to his family. He could hear their voices. Like he said, I'd be, in a, I'd be in a room and I can hear them off in a distance and I'd be searching frantically, trying to find my kids, trying to find my family and I could never get back to them. And I thought to myself, man, I said this. I said, man, that sounds like a nightmare. He said it was. To think about the people that you love and I can never get to them. He said it was like hell. I said, man, yeah, absolutely. Any parent, that's gonna break your heart a hundred times over and so he said when he came out of that coma by the grace of God, he was given a second chance. And he realized, man, why was I putting all these other things as a higher priority than what really matters? So he realized what really matters to me is not success. It's not money. It's not possessions. It's these people. It's my family. So he made a determination when he came out of that coma to put God first and to put his family first and to make sure that they are all in church together because that's what's most important. And that's what he's been doing. He said, man, I wish I didn't waste so much time chasing after all this other stuff when I realized this is all that really matters. We don't have to wait for a crisis to get our attention. Amen? We don't have to wait for something drastic to make us realize that chasing after success, fame, fortune, notoriety is not going to satisfy us at the end. Because when we're on our deathbeds, we're not going to say, can I, can I drive my car one last time? You know, can I, can I, can I swim in my pool one last time? We're not going to say that. We're going to say, where are the people? I want the people that matter most to me. How are they doing? Are they okay? That's what's going to matter most to us. We don't have to wait for a crisis to get us to start laying the right foundation. We don't have to wait for a crisis to get our attention and stop chasing after the wrong things and put God at the center of our families. We shouldn't have to wait for that. We can do that today. Amen? And we can begin building a foundation that will last not just in our lifetime, but for generations to come. My prayer is this that we'll lay a foundation of faith in our families now, that generations after us will say, I'm blessed because of what you guys did in your generation. I'm blessed today because of what my grandma did or what my mom did or what my dad did and how they laid a foundation of faith. I'm blessed because of their sacrifice. Most of us grew up inheriting curses from our family, whether it's alcoholism, divorce, abuse, neglect, insecurity, fear, you name it. Generations after us can inherit blessing, joy, peace, hope, love, security. It starts with us today. Can I hear an amen to that? But we have to put him at the center, and we have to keep God at the center. Let's pray this morning. Father, we thank you for your word that challenges us. All of us drift. None of us here do this right. But we see in your word how you're calling us to keep you the center of our lives. And I pray this morning, as difficult as it might be, we choose to do that. Jesus, we want you to be the center. Jesus, we want you to lead and guide every aspect of our lives and our families so that we can experience the fullness of your intended blessing for our lives. We invite you to come. Invade every space. Challenge us where we need to be challenged so that we can leave a legacy, not just in our families, but in our communities and in the nation 
but it starts with our home and it starts with me. It's right where you are with every head bowed and every eye closed. I want to invite the Holy Spirit to speak to our hearts. What are those areas where we tend to drift? What are those areas of our lives where we chase after other things? Maybe it is fame, fortune, money, success. Maybe it's a, a lust of the flesh where we chase after pleasure, alcohol, drugs, sex, whatever it is. And we're tempted to veer off of the course. Holy Spirit, speak to our hearts as we wait on you in these few moments. I'd like you to do this in your mind. I'd like you to just imagine yourself. You're walking towards whatever that thing is, that sin, that distraction, that addiction, whatever. And I want you to imagine yourself right now repenting, turning away from that sin and turning back towards the cross. I want you to see yourself do it. You're making a 180 degree turn away from whatever that sin is and you're turning back to the cross. And I want you to see Jesus standing there with his arms wide open. I want you to see the nail scarred holes in his hands. And I want you to see that smile on his face as he welcomes you back to himself. Jesus, thank you for your love. Thank you for embracing us and welcoming us home. We who are prone to wander. We thank you for your love this morning as we turn back to you in Jesus' name. Amen.